Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray with uh, Sustainable Cannabis TV. You know, it's March 1st, and you notice a different background that I have here because, you know, I'm ready to get out of the darkness and out of the snow and ready for some warm weather. I'm here today with Eric Asher, and he is the owner of Asher's Finest Rosin. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm great. Uh, thanks for asking. What's the weather like in Pennsylvania today? Uh, it's kind of wet, cold, uh, snow starting to melt, but it uh, looks like it's going to get up into the 50s this week. All right. Yeah, yeah we're going to have some warm weather here today. Um, you know, last couple of weeks have been really cold all across the country, so I think we're all ready for some, you know, some spring weather here coming up. Absolutely. So uh, Eric is in Pennsylvania, as we talked about. There's a lot going on in your state right now, which we'll get into in a minute in terms of cannabis and laws. But I'd like you first to give some background, kind of your bio to the viewers and listeners, and then tell us about Asher's Finest for Awesome. Okay. Uh, well, I started off uh, with the idea of Asher's Finest Rosin back in 2018. Uh, Pennsylvania signed medical cannabis into law in 2016, but we didn't have any operating dispensaries until 2018. That's when they issued patient cards and, and started uh, issuing cannabis. Um, the thing is, it, it's, it's been a long road, okay? One of the things that they omitted with our program, which exists in almost every other state that has medical cannabis, is home grow. Mm. Okay. Uh, when Act 16 was passed here in Pennsylvania, it did not include that. That was compromise that we had to make with the GOP who runs our state house in order to even get it at all. They didn't even want medical. Mm. But we, we compromised, I think, a little too much, but at least we have a program now. Uh, the problem with our our program when it first started was there wasn't even flour available. All that was available were concentrates and cartridges and topicals. Okay? Mm. And, and the prices were extremely high. $100 a gram for concentrates, you know, is common. Uh, half gram cartridges are 50, 50 bucks, 55 bucks, depending on who it is. So it's, it's very, uh, expensive for patients, especially disabled folks like myself on fixed incomes, to effectively medicate. Uh, about six months into the program, flour started becoming available. They legalized flour, but not for smoking, hmm. only for dry vaping or making into concentrates or edibles. So up until this day, you can buy flour and you can take it home, but you're not allowed to smoke it which is absolutely ridiculous, but it is what it is, and that's what we deal with here with our program. So, so you're saying that you can buy it, and then can you, are you allowed to smoke in your house, or, or just the laws say you can't even smoke it? You can only dry vape or make edibles out of it or turn it into concentrates. Hmm. And that's where I come in, because when flour became available, it was half the price of the concentrates, you know, relatively speaking. And I had been watching uh, videos on YouTube about people who make rosin from, from flour, and it looked to me to be a possible way to medicate more cheaply. So I bought a, a small rosin press and I, in 2018, and I started pressing flour into rosin. And I noticed a couple of things. First of all, the quality of the rosin is better than anything the dispensaries put out because all of their stuff, all of their concentrates are trim run. Mm -hmm. So everything I make is out of buds. So the quality automatically is better when you're pressing flour into rosin than it is buying a, a chemically extracted concentrate that is all trim run. Do you, uh, do you find that the that the bud, the type of bud or the strain produces different yields based on on where you get it and how it's grown? Absolutely. Um, I keep an extensive database that I make publicly available to all anybody who wants to see it of all the dispensary flour I've pressed since 2019. And uh, there's definite correlations in terms of yield, higher 
THC flower produces better, generally speaking. There are exceptions. Uh, indicas generally uh, produce better than sativas, again, with a few exceptions. Uh, and bigger buds over smaller buds. So popcorn doesn't press out as well as the, the bigger buds. Mm. Um, there, it, it, the exceptions are, are kind of interesting. Like there's a, a strain called African Thai that Prime Wellness puts out, and it's a straight sativa. But when you catch it at 30% or above THC content, it produces reliably a gram per eighth press, which mm. is a really, really good yield. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of unheard of, really. I mean, when you're when you're pressing, you know, and you and I, I know how it is myself from from pressing rosin that you have to mess with the temperature and the time and the size and the strain. It's a it's a very tricky business. But once you understand how to do it then you can pump out you know, consistently good rosin. Oh, absolutely. It's 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 less of a science and more of an artisanal process, mm -hmm. kind of like how people who brew their own beer. Or, or make their own brandy or wine. It, it, you want to control all of the environmental factors involved, and you're picking the starting material, too. And as you well know, with rosin, it's a garbage-in, garbage-out proposition. So I only press top-tier flour from the dispensary. Unfortunately, that's still very, very costly. We're talking $65, $60 eight mm. for top your flour and again when you when you get right down to it uh, most of the people who buy flour in our program probably smoke it even though it's technically not legal I mean it's just what most people are used to doing you know mm -hmm. uh, concentrates are kind of a newer phenomenon uh, especially in Pennsylvania um, nobody had had really been doing a lot of solventless in our state I decided that I wanted to show people that it was a better way to make medicine and it makes it last longer. You buy an eighth at the dispensary for $65. You take it home, that's three joints. Okay? That's half a day's worth of medicating to somebody like me who, who has a very high tolerance. But if I take an eighth and I press it in that rosin press and I get anywhere close to a gram, that medicates me. That gram will medicate me for three solid days oh. instead of half a day. So, so I it's a big difference. I mean, it's a, every it's dollar I have to spend at that dispensary, but yeah. it's beyond that because you get the pucks that are left over make edibles. So mm -hmm. you don't waste anything. Every byproduct of this process is medicinally valuable. Most people with their dab rigs. You know, they're running ISO through these to clean them. Mm -hmm. I get 200 proof food grade grain alcohol. And I make a tincture completely out of reclaim. Mm. So it's already activated. It's already uh, been through the heating process, obviously, when it, when it got made into reclaim. But it, 200 proof ethanol dissolves THC at the rate of 20 milligrams per milliliter. Mm. So... I have a gallon of extremely potent 200 proof THC tincture that I don't drink it because I'm not a drinker anymore, haven't been for years, but I take it and reduce the alcohol away and recoup the oil. Hmm. Fecco, full extract cannabis oil. And because I press so many different strains all the time because I'm constantly doing content for my YouTube channel showing people what different strains are doing, um, the entourage effect from the oil that I produce is a, a order of magnitude more effective as a medicine than most of the single component RSOs you're going to get at the dispensary. Mm. So I've made it my mission to teach people the process or my, my version of the process because every rosin presser has different equipment, they approach it with a different philosophy, and they use different temperatures and timing and pressures. Mm -hmm. I can only show people what my method does. But most rosin pressers who are pressing flour, average yields are between 14 and 24%. Yeah. That's where most people live. When you look at my database, 
I have some of those yields. I have some bad beats too because you get surprised sometimes. But I live 27 to 35 percent yields. Wow. I, choose, I choose my flour very carefully. I rehydrate it properly to 68 to 75 percent RH. Hmm. I press it very carefully, and I get really good results. And I just don't put it on paper. I back it up with the videos on my YouTube channel. That's kind of my resume. I've so got a. You don't, you don't have a, a company. Your your mission really is education. Education and advocacy, because part of educating people is helping to destigmatize the plant. People have been fed a lie for eight decades. Up until 1937, it was in our pharmacopoeia. You could go and buy tinctures at your pharmacy until they made it illegal with the marijuana tax stamp act. Mm. Okay, so it, you're, we're trying to get rid of a lot of false information, false narratives, and ignorance that have been perpetrated for the last eight decades. That doesn't happen overnight. Mm. So I, even before I knew for sure it was legal to do it, I managed to get the Medical Marijuana Education Center in Pittsburgh to allow me to be the very first person in the history of the state of Pennsylvania to give a live class pressing flour hmm. in a public venue. And I, I did that. I was waiting for that other shoe to drop, with the cops to show up, with DOH to do anything about it. But I found a loophole. Hmm. See, I can't press other people's flour legally if I charge the money for it, because then I am an unlicensed uh, processor, okay, which is a big deal in PA. But if I do it for free, I'm legal to do it. One patient can do it for another. We're legal to have to use the equipment. So for me to do it for another patient, I've made it my my entire bedrock of this this whole thing that I do is I process for patients for free. They bring me dispensary flour. Oh. I, it in, I press it into rosin for them, and they're getting better medicine. They're getting it cheaper because they're buying flour instead of spending eighty to one hundred and ten dollars a gram for concentrate. Well, you know, you talked about dispensary flour. What about the importance of homegrown in Pennsylvania? Did I lose you there? I can't uh, can't hear you now, Eric. Oh, there we go. It's... There. Oh, all right. So the um, what um, what about uh, the importance of homegrown in Pennsylvania? You talked about dispensary flour. What about homegrown and and how how do you see that? Well, here's here's the thing. Like I like I said before, when Act 16 got signed into law, it was absent a homegrown provision for patients. So there is no homegrown legal in Pennsylvania. But right now, there is a bill going through our state house that looks like it may pass. Hmm. Still don't know because it's still controlled by the GOP. But uh, Senator Sharif Street and a bunch of other uh, Pennsylvania legislators have crafted a bill that will include, uh, for adult use legalization, will include home growth for patients. I don't know what the particulars are. But I do know that that's in the bill that's in, in the House being debated right now. Hmm. Uh, who knows what it's going to come out with after the compromise that goes to the governor's desk. But what we saw in New Jersey was not true legalization. And I'm concerned that they're going to try to pull it here in PA. Ah. New Jersey went, what they said was full legal, but they didn't include home growth. So people are still going to be criminalized for growing a plant that they can go down to a dispensary and buy legally, but they can't grow it themselves. And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that's not true legalization. So part of what I do, besides educating people and traveling all over the state and, and demoing the process and answering questions, is I go to the state house and I speak at rallies. I uh, talk to the different legislators that are in my part of the state. and and make sure that they're on board and that they're educated properly as to what's going on and what's at stake. Uh, we already dropped the ball uh, by letting New Jersey legalize prior to us. 
Now, we had been told in 2017 by our Auditor General that we stood to lose half a billion dollars year one. The minute one of our neighbors actually legalizes, and now New Jersey has. So we're going to reap the whirlwind of inaction from our state legislators. And unlike other states, in Pennsylvania, because we're a commonwealth, we don't have the luxury of doing a binding referendum that's voter-initiated like most of the other states that got legalization did. Yeah. Everything that comes in a referendum has come through the state house. Oh. So they've been killing bill after bill after bill ever since 2016 for adult legalization because the Republicans do not want it. They don't they they didn't want medical. Like I said, they begrudgingly gave us access to it. But with that that fatal flaw of not allowing home grow. So it's it's a matter of Winning over hearts and minds, it's a long and laborious process. There's a lot of people besides myself. You know, there's there's Lehigh Valley Normal, Pittsburgh Normal, uh, Balanced Veterans and Operation 1620 that are all spearheading efforts to try and change the minds of some of these legislators. But uh, it's it's a long process. And well, what you know, when you know, you, you're talking about changing hearts and minds. So let's talk yes. about specific points of education that you try to work with uh, the legislators on or the lawmakers to change their minds. What would those points be that you need to consistently work on to change their mind? Well, you know, you start off talking to them about money because that's usually what will get their attention quickly. Uh, unfortunately. Pennsylvania, we have a very puritanical sort of history, you know, with with uh, various religious groups from the Quakers to the Amish and, and so on. So we have we have Pittsburgh on the western side of the state and Philly on the eastern side of the state, and they're both very progressive, very you know up to date on what's going on, especially with cannabis culture. Then you have the rest of Pennsylvania which is mostly rural and semi-rural uh, and very conservative. Hmm. Um, so trying to reach out to conservative rural folks that have been lied to for eight decades doesn't happen overnight. When, what you know, are the major objections people, that you're seeing? Well, the objections are it's evil, it's a, it's a gateway drug, all the same crap that you always hear from, these, from the same sides, the same tired arguments. What about the children? Well, if you're doing your job as a parent, you don't have to worry about the children getting a hold of it. But dispensaries aren't going to sell it to children. Right. If you're doing your job as a parent and keeping an eye on your kid, then that is not an issue that law enforcement should be taking up. That is your responsibility. And that's one of the things that, that people just don't get, personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. You can't ask the government to, to make everything safe for you. You have to exercise some common sense. Right. You know, and, and that's shocking, shockingly lacking today hmm. among a lot of our legislators. They're not very pragmatic at all. They, they see the fact that New Jersey's going to start taking not just tourism dollars and tax money, but our best and brightest minds who want to establish themselves in the cannabis space are not going to stay here under the kind of restrictions we have when we look at states like Michigan, Colorado, Oklahoma, you know, that are just wide open and people are prospering. Mm -hmm. That's what we're missing. Mm. We wanted corporate players to be able to play here. So when they did Act 16, they made it, they made the cost of entry so high that only multi-state vertically integrated companies were able to play here. And they don't want to change that paradigm. Hmm. So when you start talking about home grow, they start thinking it's going to hit their bottom line. But the thing is, when you're talking about patients growing, even if they made it legal tomorrow, less than, I think, 5% of people are going to have the space, the money for the equipment, and the wherewithal to see it through mm -hmm. to actually grow plants for themselves. Right. And those people are not going to inflict any damage to their bottom line at all. Okay. 
So those are the kind of things you need to kind of, because they have lobbyists, you know, and we have to be our own lobbyists. And we do that with various rates of success. Um, we don't get the, the kind of crowds that we used to get at, at rallies. Now, part of that's COVID, obviously, right now, but even before that. People, hey, um, you know, I'm wondering, you know, you were, you were talking about how you don't get that much, I guess, um, press coverage or awareness for what you're doing and what you're doing is so valuable. Why is that? Do you think that, that it's not, um, well, I'm, I'm not exactly sure because I've, I mean, I've gotten coverage from Pennsylvania cable news when I was at the state house speaking in 2019. Um, but I think that the local news really just right now they're overwhelmed with COVID stuff. Right. And, and with the new administration and the things that they're trying to get accomplished. So it's trying to do a feel good story about a, a, a disabled vet who's trying to, to, you know, educate people out there and advocate for, for other homeless veterans is not something that they prioritize very highly right now. Wow. Um, however, things like your show and some of the other podcasts that I've been on have given me a vehicle to be able to tell people what's going on here in Pennsylvania. Things that, that, I'm, that I've been doing since 2018. Again, process for patients for free. That's, that's something I've, I've always done. Um, I go to public events. I never charge to do events. I go there as an educator, I'm not there to sell anything. I don't even monetize a YouTube channel. I have no, no income from any of my activities regarding cannabis. Oh, However, hmm. that will change when the federal law changes. You know, I'm a patient man. I'm building Asher's Finest Draws and Brands by showing the kind of quality I put out when I'm given the right material. So yeah. that when they, they flip that switch at the federal level, I'll be able to step away from my disability and actually own a business that will be different than most of the other people in the cannabis space because the, the proceeds from any money I ever make doing this are going to go into building high density housing for homeless veterans right here in Pennsylvania. Now that evolved. I started off wanting to build a tiny home community, like buying an old trailer park and tearing all that away, building new tiny homes. These would be given freely to a homeless veteran with no obligation, no rent, no anything. This is yours. I was homeless myself for a year back in the 90s. After I got out from the war, I was a basket case. 1994, I lost my house. I was out homeless for a year in Pittsburgh. I don't ever want to see that happen again to another veteran if I can help it. I don't need to be rich. I'm 52 years old. I, I have a very finite time left. I want to create a legacy, yeah. a good legacy. Okay? And I want to put the same kind of energy and drive that I did into my military service into this. So it started off being about tiny homes. And then I started thinking COVID opened up an opportunity. There's a lot of hotels and motor lodges on these interstates, okay? And they're empty. A lot of went out of business. Those can be bought relatively inexpensively and remodeled into studio apartments. Yeah. And you have common areas where you bring in veteran services officers and help these guys with their disability claims or getting them resources and they would all be at the same place but it wouldn't be a facility, it would be an apartment building. Mm. But these guys would be able to have something they could call their own. That's transformative to somebody who has nothing. I know. So that is my mission. I want to take what I love doing which is making rosin. I want to be able to monetize it when it's Legal to do so, and I want to take the money I make from that, and I want to build apartments to house homeless veterans, and that is what Asher's finest rosin is. That's my end game. I don't care about being rich; never have. Okay? It's about helping people. I was real good at my job in the army, killing people. I'm much better at helping people now, and it's much more rewarding. It's a great, it's a great mission to have, and and more people 
need to know about well, what you're doing. It's it's great that you're helping people. Let's go. Let's end up here with a little bit of your personal history um, to end this up, and then uh, and then we'll you know you can talk about where where people can find your YouTube channel and all that stuff. But you know, just give us some history, and then and then we'll end it up. Well, my my history of cannabis is is rather long, so I'll condense it real real quickly for you. I smoked flour at a very young age, 1975, seven years old. A bunch of high school kids were getting high behind the uh, elementary school one summer when I was out riding my bicycle. Hmm. I snuck up on them. I heard the transistor radio playing, and they were in some cattails. They got me high. Um, I didn't realize at the time what that was going to mean to me later on. But um, I had a very troubled childhood. Parents divorced at 10. I was a, uh, I was a nightmare to my family, uh, constantly in trouble. And by the time I was 16, I was kicked out of the house and moved to California, which is where I'm from originally, actually. Went all over the United States. Uh, my dad moved around a lot. But uh, when I got... 18, I got my GED, and I joined the California Conservation Corps, which is a, a state agency that fight forest fires, and they do a lot of other things. I worked for them for two years, and then my contract was up, and I moved back to Pittsburgh, because I have family here, my home alongside the families from Pittsburgh. Looking for work as an electrician for the find it, ended up joining the Army out of Pittsburgh in, in December of 88. Um, Fast forward to June of 89, and I landed West Germany hmm. uh, as a freshly minted uh, 13 Mike, which is a multiple launch rocket system crew member. Uh, newest weapon system the Army had at the time, so I was excited to, to see what it could do. Arrived in, in West Germany, like I said, just before the wall fell. Now, I immediately found the guys in my unit who got high. Because that's just the way things are. And we smoked incredible hash. Moroccan hash, Afghani hash, <clears throat> sold by Turkish people in Frankfurt. <laughs> but then you go to, to Amsterdam. And I got to go to Amsterdam in 89 and, and see what that was like. Because, it, you know, that was always kind of the mecca at the time, you know, for, for, for stoners. So I got to see what what that system was like and, and how it's not fully legal, but it's tolerated, but it's almost just like it's legal. Yeah. So nice. But then I got, I, you know, I go to the war and I got sick from a lot of the chemical exposures. We were exposed to serin and, and a lot of mm. oil smoke and things like that. It really screwed me up. I couldn't be a soldier. My lungs were too messed up. I couldn't run. Mm. So I got honorable discharge, but I was supposed to be I was supposed to, I was supposed to be a soldier, you know. Oh, that uh -huh. was like you know, like a fireman or a cop or a priest. They have a calling, you know. Yeah. I, that was my identity, and all of a sudden that was gone. So wow. it, mentally and emotionally, I was a wreck, and mm. I was doing a lot of harder drugs back then because I just could not deal. And what I found was once I got out of being homeless and got Back into life, I had some new coping mechanisms that the VA through counseling, and they put me on a bunch of meds, you know, for depression, help me sleep, and all this stuff. That was killing me. It's mm. killing my liver. It's killing my kidneys, and it was making me into a zombie. I had no emotions at all, wow. and I decided that I would rather have emotions than not because it. Yeah. It's easy to turn into a sociopath without empathy, right? And I found that by the judicious use of cannabis, and this is well before it was legal here in Pennsylvania, I was self-medicating. I was able to get off of and be fully functional without any of those drugs in me. I got off all the psych meds. I got off a lot of my other meds. The, the physical stuff started to improve a bit. Um, and then once... Once cannabis became legal here in PA in 2016, I had just come back from 12 years down in Florida. I had been down there from 04 to 16, 
And I was a state correctional officer down there for two years. I was a Gulf County Auxiliary Deputy and a transport officer and a juvenile justice officer. Mm -hmm. During the period I was down there, I wore a badge. Uh, did not use cannabis during a lot of that time, but towards the end I did. And when I came back here to PA in 16 and they had just signed their law, we had just gotten Florida signed. I was part of the Yes On Two amendment thing that was going on in 2010. We got it on the ballot in 2012, but missed it by 2%. We got 58% wow. of the vote. We needed 60. And, and then it looks like they got it right in 2016, just as I was moving back to PA. Yeah. So now that I've been here, uh, again, 2018 is when I established Asher's Finest Raws, and then I started making the educational videos, doing my outreach, going to public events, uh, cannabis festival in Kutztown. Uh, I was the first one ever invited to public libraries. I've been to the Penn Hills Public Library. Uh, it's, I just keep breaking down barriers because the more people that see this aren't cannabis people, you can show them this isn't a scary thing. This is a natural thing. Just taking this this plant, you're crushing it with heat and pressure, and you're bringing the soul of that plant out. Yeah. That's how I approach draws and pressing. I don't know if that's why I get better yields than a lot of people, but I just think I approach it a little differently than a lot of other people. My that's temperature right. tends to be a bit it's lower. Great. You know, it's a great, great story, great history. Um, Love what you're doing. Can you tell people how to get a hold of your, um, how to see your YouTube channels on these so they can learn more about Absolutely. you and perhaps an email here when we need to wrap it up? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I'm real easy to find. I have, I have all my stuff is right there. My YouTube channel, my Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Got it. The all really right. cool thing about the LinkedIn is. I just got a really nice compliment from the head of Pennsylvania's medical marijuana program uh, based on a video. See, a lot of these people follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, and just out of the blue, he, comp he, he complimented me on what I do for patients. Okay, a lot of people don't think that what I do is legal. It is legal. I've been doing it for three years now with zero issues with either the police I had the chief of police come in while I was pressing at a library. He came in, he saw what I was doing, said, oh, that's pretty cool, and walked huh. out. You know, I know I know what I can and can't do to stay on the right side of the law with this. So, yep. you know, I, I, I use that to my advantage. I, I use that to be able to push the boundaries and show people what this process can do to help you make better medicine medicate more effective and make your money last for a while. Oh, that's that's great well i encourage the viewers and listeners to uh check out eric's youtube channel reach out to him if you have any questions and you know good luck pressing forward with with what's going on in pennsylvania and uh thank you for being on the show thank you very much for having me i really appreciate it all right thank you take care